Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson, for this talk on the presidency, uh, on the history and the presidency and the life of Barack Obama. Thank you. Hi, I uh, need to get set up here. So give me just a second. There we go. Good. Uh, this is week two. Uh, and again, as Judy uh, mentioned to all of you, there's no class next week. Uh, see you October 27th. Uh, today, uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, Obama getting involved in politics. Uh, Last week, we talked about his family of origin and his marriage family a little and, uh, and uh, his early life and education, so on. Now, today, we begin with Obama being involved in politics. His first political engagement was in the Illinois State Senate. So that's not the US Senate, it's the Illinois uh, state uh, Senate. Uh, he was in a Democratic Party district where he lived, and uh, he was elected there. Uh, and it was from Chicago's South Side, which is a predominantly Black uh, neighborhood. And while he was in the Illinois uh, State Senate, he introduced a tremendous amount of legislation, and we're going to go through some of it. It'll show us where his attitudes and opinions were. Uh, at, at this time, uh, in the early 2000s, he had lots of uh, uh, support uh, from the Republican Party also within the state of Illinois. Uh, themes of his legislation, first is health care and uh, you know, this is a piece of social legislation. Uh, so it's uh, seeing to it that uh, people have access to adequate health care. Uh, the legislation that he introduced basically was to expand health care, make it available to more people, uh, hopefully not just through their uh, jobs. You get unemployed, you have no health care, et cetera. There we go. Um, ethical standards for legislators. In other words, uh, what's the proper uh, kind of behavior that legislators should be exhibiting? And that there should be some laws and some understandings about uh, relationships with uh, donors and uh, corporations and other other groups. Uh, morality, we often hear about, uh, and we often hear the term ethics. There is a difference. Uh, morals are a set of principles. So that's uh, one, two, three, here is how you should behave. Ethics is then the actual behavior that follows from those uh, principles. So legislation on ethics is what are you doing as a legislator? And uh, we, that's stuff we can see and it should be within the realm of certain guiding principles. Uh, he was also interested in tax cuts, but uh, for a different group of people, uh, oftentimes we hear about tax cuts and therefore the super wealthy 
uh, Obama's legislation that he was introducing was about people at the bottom receiving tax cuts, uh, such as people below a certain uh, income level, say $12,000 or $20,000, not having to pay any tax at all. Uh, child care subsidies was another major theme in the Obama Illinois Senate legislation. Uh, you know, how can we uh, help people uh, with child care before those children are in school or in kindergarten? Even in kindergarten, there were problems because that was a half day generally, or is a half day. And Minnesota has been increased to a full day, but uh, uh, that's half a day. What happens to your children the other half of the day while you're working? Uh, one of the major things that could be done here is simply increase present schooling from age five kindergarten, do it to, from age three. Uh, payday store loans was another legisl uh, group of uh, legislative ideas that he had. Um, it's 10 days until your payday, you get paid every two weeks, but you're out of money and the rent's due. So you go to one of these payday loan stores and you say, I need my, paycheck that's I won't get for 10 days. I need it now. Okay, well, uh, here, well, how, what's your pay, et cetera, et cetera. And okay, we can give you this much money, but then you have to give us thus and such, and then there'll be these fees. Uh, so these advances on paychecks uh, didn't have very much regulation for these companies. And uh, there were some kind of nefarious practices. So he wanted to get legislation passed that would regulate these payday loan companies. Also mortgage loan companies. Uh, what we see with mortgage loans is um, redlining. Uh, there are certain areas of the city where as a bank or a mortgage firm, we will not make loans to houses that are located within those districts. Uh, and frequently those are districts that are people of color. Here is a, a map of the city of Minneapolis and all those red blotches are places where uh, banks were not making loans uh, 20 years ago. Uh, redlining areas, no loans available. Uh, banks felt something was wrong in those neighborhoods. Either the housing was too old, crumbling, falling apart, or they were uh, racial minorities, uh, or, or the income level was low, etc. cetera. Uh, another thing that he uh, wanted passed uh, dealt with racial profiling. And he wanted uh, everyone that got arrested, you have to list their race. So we know, okay, here we are in Chicago. Let's say 12% of the population of Chicago is uh, uh, blacks, but 40% of the arrests are blacks. We wanna find that out, uh, see what to do about it. Uh, see if we can uh, train the police in some other way, or why is uh, a third of the police force in a very small area that encompasses uh, minority populations, etc. cetera. Uh, he uh, got legislation passed, the first such law in the United States uh, for the state of Illinois that required the filming of homicide interrogations. So when you're being questioned by the police, it has to be filmed. Uh, that's now uh, done regularly across the United States. So you can see, uh, is there any uh, intimidation that's going on? How long does the interrogation last? I taught a criminology class for about 
10 years. I just taught one section of it. I was teaching psychology at the time. And then I do one section of criminology. And uh, we had a guy come in who trained uh, uh, interrogators for the entire state of Minnesota. He said, give me a room with a table that's screwed down to the floor, a chair that's screwed down to the floor, nothing on any of the walls. And I can have a, per I can be in and out questioning a person, have them in there for 10 hours, and the likelihood of getting them to confess to just about anything is very high. Oh. Uh, also, uh, you know, today, uh, kind of related to videotaping uh, homicide interrogations is uh, videotaping all interrogations and in the present day, uh, police body cameras. Uh, we do see occasionally there there's an arrest being made but uh oh gee we forgot to turn on our cameras or we turned our cameras off or something so an issue is keep the cameras on all the time and the other issue is do you even want your police department to have body cameras uh, so themes of legislation health care uh, standards that regulate legislators and how they behave, what they do, uh, tax cuts uh, for the poor, child care subsidies uh, for people with children uh, under the school age, payday store loan regulations, mortgage loan company regulations, racial profiling, uh, and uh, videotaping interrogations. Now, Obama uh, and the United States House of Representatives. Let's take a look at that. Ob Obama ran in the Democrat primaries. He tried to unseat an incumbent Democratic legislator, but he lost big time. Notice here how I use the word Democrat as opposed to Democratic Party in the Democratic primaries or the Democrat primaries. Uh, the use of the word Democrat was uh, something that was started by Republicans. They stated that uh, as a Republican party, we're also democratic. We believe in democracy. So the Democratic party should not uh, be able to call itself democratic. Drop the IC, you are the Democrat party. And it was kind of a, a you know, negative term at the time it came into use, but it's an interesting uh, concept. The Republicans then maybe should be called the Republic Party, not the Republican Party, but uh, so Obama lost that primary election trying to unseat a member of his own party. What he does next is he runs for the United States Senate from the state of Illinois. And uh, this was in 2004. Uh, the big issue was the Iraqi war or the war against Iraq. Here you can see in the photo uh, a group of protesters. Uh, there was lots of protest against this war. U.S. entry uh, into this war, uh, you know, where are the weapons of mass destruction? Never found, uh, but we went in anyway. Obama opposed the war during this 2004 Senate campaign. Uh, the war was uh, two years old at the time. Uh, here's Obama speaking at a rally uh, that was uh, opposed to the war. Uh, during the campaign, he spoke at two such uh, anti-Iraq war uh, rallies. I've drawn a circle around one gentleman there. Uh, it's on the stand behind Obama. That's uh, Jesse Jackson on the left. Uh, 2004 Senate campaign, there were a total of 15 candidates attempting to get the 
uh, nomination. Obama won in the primary and he won big time. These aren't the actual candidates. It's a bunch of college students, but there's 15 of them. So, and it's in Chicago. The Democrats uh, nominate uh, Obama. And uh, during that campaign, his first book is released. And uh, he talks about, uh, or talks begin about him. Uh, gee, this guy could be president. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, everybody's looking forward to something higher even than the US uh, Senate uh, campaign. Uh, a lot of politicians release these campaign biographies. Uh, you might want to consider this Dreams from My Father as such a book of campaign biography. The one from for presidents has become very common that uh, a biography of the candidates is released during the campaign for president of the United States. The most famous campaign biography of all time is the one written by Franklin Pierce back in the 1850s. Uh, it was actually about Franklin Pierce, he didn't write it, had his name on it as the writer. But uh, the reason it's the most popular one and the most expensive one to buy is because it was uh, written by his college roommate. Uh, Pierce's college roommate was the famous novelist, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, already talked about this, uh, the nature of campaign biographies or common uh, way to advertise your candidacy. So Obama wins the, the Democratic Party primaries uh, with 15 candidates in it. So he's now running in the election for the US Senate. This is his opponent, uh, Jack Ryan. Uh, he's the Republican candidate. He was losing big time. Uh, the polls showed that uh, Obama was going to win with uh, uh, a vast majority of the votes. And uh, so the guy's losing. Then his ex-wife comes on the scene and starts making pronouncements about what kind of a guy he was at home. And that uh, really killed him. This is his wife. Uh, who he was divorced from at the time he was running, Jerry Ryan. She was an actress, did a tremendous amount of TV work, is still active. Uh, she was most famous at this time as one of the actresses on Star Trek Voyager series. So there's been several Star Trek series, but in 2004, she was on TV. Now, for some reason, usually it's because there's something very negative in there. Their divorce papers were sealed, not released to the public. Uh, and uh, she started making public statements about um, lots of problems in the marriage. Well, that was the end of Jack Ryan. He dropped out of the race, told the Republican Party, I'm done running. The Republican Party then nominates a black man who they think will be able to cut into this tremendous vote margin that Obama has built up uh, so they can get votes from the black community. This is Alan Keyes. He becomes the Republican candidate. Under Ronald Reagan, he had been an assistant secretary of state. Uh, he was most famous for uh, as a health science scammer. Uh, this was the brand that he used, MMS. It stands for Miracle Mineral Solution, MMS. And uh, these were pills that you could take to uh, just make yourself feel better. He sold them through a company called Genesis Two Church of Health and Healing. 
So he takes on the uh, authority of a church group uh, in order to add to the sales of these uh, tablets. Uh, he sold them in the US. You could buy them on Amazon uh, back in 2004. Uh, but the biggest sales were on the African continent. And they were touted as curing malaria, which is uh, a major disease in Africa, and curing diabetes also. Uh, it contains chlorine dioxide. Now that sounds like bleach, but it isn't. There's no chlorine dioxide in bleach. Uh, small amounts of this chlorine dioxide are not harmful to people. Larger amounts can become very toxic, very dangerous. Uh, there has been more recently an advocate for the injection of bleach to prevent COVID. Uh, the election results, Obama got 3.6 million votes, Alan Keyes 1.4 million. Uh, this is 70% of the vote went to Barack Obama, 27% to Keyes and 3% to um, other candidates. So gigantic win. Also, this makes Barack Obama the only United States Senator uh, who is a black man. Uh, about 10% of the population was black at the time. So uh, that would mean may, maybe as many as 10 black senators if they were equally represented and uh, Obama was the only one. Uh, Obama legislation as a United States Senator. Where does this guy stand on issues? Uh, first bill that we're gonna talk about is the Secure America and Orderly Immigration Act, 2005. This is his first year in the Senate. He co-sponsored it, which means uh, there was at least one other, but maybe several other senators who said, yeah, I like this bill. Uh, the first thing this bill uh, wanted to do was uh, any illegal immigrant currently residing in the United States is now a legal immigrant. So you legalize any immigrants that came into the country illegally. Second created a guest worker program. This is temporary. You want to come into the United States and do some work? Okay, here's a three-year visa. You can come in and uh, uh, do this work for some company that uh, exists in the United States. After three years, you have to go back to your home country. Uh, here's uh, some of the uh, political uh, drawings from the time. I want you to stay in Mexico uh, or do grunt work for cash on the side. You know, uh, immigration into the United States uh, by uh, people, especially from Central America, not just Mexico, uh, exempted agricultural workers. So agricultural companies growing on huge gigantic plots of land in California could bring in immigrants, uh, people without any legal status in, for planting and harvest time, maybe three week periods in the uh, spring and fall. So exemptions were made for big agricultural industries. Uh, border enforcement, uh, we need uh, stronger borders was part of this uh, bill uh, so that people cannot easily cross in to the United States from Mexico. Many of them, of course, coming from countries further south, but having to pass through Mexico in order to get into the United States. Senate refused to consider the act. It never even made it to the floor. 
Uh, the Luger Obama Act of 2005. Uh, this is Richard Luger. He's a Republican US Senator from Indiana and he and Barack Obama uh, co-sponsored, uh, co-wrote, uh, co-authored uh, this piece of legislation which has their names on it. What it's, what it's about is nuclear weapons. Uh, we'll give assistance to countries who agree not to uh, aid other countries without nuclear weapons in obtaining them. You can't give it to them or you can't give them the technology to do it. Uh, if you agree to that, then we'll give you some assistance, usually financial. Anytime you see an arrow through a graphic, it means I've got a bigger image on the next page. Uh, here is a map of the world. All the countries in red have nuclear weapons. Everything in green does not. So if you agree not to spread nuclear weapons to other countries, uh, here's what we'll do for you. And generally that's a financial reward of some sort. Uh, it uh, was not just nuclear weapons, it also included chemical and biological weapons. There are symbols for these weapons that have been agreed to internationally. So anytime a, a steel drum or any other container has a symbol on it, you can look at it and say, for instance, this symbol on the right, you can say, well, that has a uh, chemical uh, weapon of some sort in it or a biological weapon. Uh, and these things, you know, these can be gases that could be released and kill people. Uh, they could be diseases that uh, could be released and kill people. Uh, the United States uh, has been involved in some of this within our own country. And there have been lawsuits. They released biological weapons in several cities across the US, the United States government did. Minneapolis was included. Uh, about a dozen people died in Seattle, Washington. And uh, one of the people that died had a nephew who was an attorney and he sued uh, and won the case. Uh, so there were reparations made for the testing of these weapons uh, by the US government within the United States. Another aspect of the Luger Obama Act was uh, not just nuclear weapons, but conventional weapons, such as rifles and pistols. Here is a picture of a soldier with a sol shoulder launchable uh, missile. Uh, and uh, that should be shoulder launched, not shoulder laughed missiles. Anyway, uh, uh, those kinds of conventional weapons also could not be uh, traded with other countries. Uh, after two years of consideration in 2007, uh, this act was passed. Uh, Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Let's take a look at the provisions. Uh, any business that receives federal money, here's a grant, might be 20 million, it might be $2 billion. Uh, well, where's that money going? A uh, part of this Transparency Act is you have to tell us the names of the company, companies who receive federal money. That must be published, made public, and all the names of their subsidiaries, that is, companies that they also own. One of the recipients was Purdue Pharma. So here's Purdue Pharma. And there's a list of its subsidiaries, other companies that they own. Avrio Health, 
Adlon Therapeutics, Embryum Therapeutics, Rhodes Pharmaceuticals. Uh, some things have their own name on them. Many do not, uh, but you can see there's tons of, or there, well, here there's maybe uh, a dozen or so uh, subsidiaries that are owned by Purdue Pharma. I had a friend who uh, lived near Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, taught psychology there. And uh, he and his wife would come up and visit us occasionally. His wife grew up with a woman who married the chief executive officer of uh, the, you know, holiday gas stations. Uh, he, he was the head honcho there. And uh, we went over to his house so they could all talk. We're sitting there and he's telling us how the day before he had to testify in court uh, about uh, uh, holiday gas stations and their 106 subsidiaries. Uh, the amount of the reward, it could be a gift that you're giving to uh, most likely a company within the United States. Or the contract, what services are they providing or what products are they providing? That had to be published along with the name of the company and all its subsidiaries. So how much did they get? What was it for? A gift, services, products, and you have to publish that make it public. Uh, the branch of government that did the funding must be included in the disclosure. And a description of the uh, award's purpose and its use. In other words, uh, why did you get this money? What are you going to use it for? So this is from the Department of Defense. and. Uh, uh, it's uh, funding for thus and such or so on. Uh, the location of the company benefiting. <clears throat> you, okay, we got the name of the company. We got how much money it is. We got what government agency is uh, involved in the distribution of this award. But you need to tell us uh, about the company. Where is it located? City, state, country, and what congressional district is it in? <clears throat> so name the recipients of the money. What did they get? The government branch that paid it out and the location of the recipients. And this bill passed. You can go look this up. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget has a website. And it lists all this stuff. And here's the website. Uh, it's unfortunate these website listings are so long. Usually you can type in something and get to the website. At any rate, um, you know, what you could try here is uh, government subsidies. Type that in, see what happens. Uh, if you want this address, feel free to write to me. Uh, I think most of you probably have my email address. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. You can go in there, find me, and tell me that um, you want this web address. But uh, you can go in there and look up uh, all of these financial distributions from the U.S. government. Uh, another uh, Obama legislation. Notification of nuclear leaks bill. This was 2008 that this bill was introduced. If there's a uh, nuclear leak of some kind, you have to tell the cities and states where the leak occurred. You need to warn them. I mean, who wouldn't know about something like this? It's a big fire. But what about just a gas leak? Um, this bill failed. It failed in the U.S. Senate. It did not. Uh, it did not pass. So 
nuclear uh, companies using uh, nuclear material uh, does, do not have to disclose a leak. A class action fairness act 2005 okay what are we talking about here this uh, is a bill uh, now class action fairness they're talking about class action lawsuits those are lawsuits where hundreds of people are involved so there might be uh, you know some kind of chemical release by a company into the water and people drink that water in a city of uh, 300,000, and there might be 10,000 people got sick as a result of it. So um, what's gonna happen with this class action or large group lawsuit? Uh, the first thing they wanted to do was prevent abuse uh, in lawsuits. Uh, no more legal abuse. Um, One way that they're doing this is they're saying that uh, any amount that you're suing somebody for that is over $5 million has to be moved to the federal court. Uh, let's say you got a big company, they release something into the water, lots of people get sick, the lawsuit stays in the state. Uh, there are judges who might be sympathetic to that company within the state local judges that uh, are worried uh, this company is going to leave this area if we uh, sue them or they'll file bankruptcy and open up someplace else and et cetera. So this bill is saying, uh, let's get it out of the hands of local authorities, place it in the hands of the federal uh, courts where there may not be uh, that bias or that sort of relationship about uh, losing a company. Any case over 100 clients has to be decided in a federal court. So any class action lawsuit is now defined as being over 100 clients and that moves it up to federal courts. Uh, Republican critics of the bill uh, said um, that if you allow these class action lawsuits to go ahead and be tried in federal courts, what you're really doing is depriving individuals uh, from taking action against a corporation or uh, some group that uh, may have created a problem of some sort. So what happens to individual lawsuits? Uh, and uh, the Republicans argued that uh, uh, this could include, uh, for instance, the tobacco industry, oil industry, chemical and asbestos industry, uh, where uh, there were lots of individual lawsuits in the past. And what's gonna happen to these individual lawsuits now with, uh, with the, all these new regulations for class action suits. Uh, class action lawsuits, they're more difficult due to this law. Uh, so they're saying um, it's gonna be harder to file a class action lawsuit because it all has to occur at the federal level. Uh, class action lawsuits will clog the courts. Decisions will take longer. The federal courts will be packed. Uh, well, individual lawsuits would do that also. Uh, federal judges are appointed by the president of the United States. They are part of the federal court system. They are controlled by the executive branch of the federal government. You're taking power away from the states by advancing any of these class action lawsuits to uh, the federal courts. Uh, again, a state's rights argument. Uh, 
Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, 1978. Okay, this is something that was passed uh, 30 years ago, but we're going to amend it. So there's amendments to this uh, Intelligence Act in 2008. Uh, telecommunications companies are declared immune from lawsuits. So this is like tel the telephone companies in 1978 uh, were dealt with. Uh, now they're amending this to say, you, you can't uh, sue a telecommunications company. Uh, the reason telecommunications companies had been turning over conversations to government agencies. They listen in on your phone conversation or they do searches for key words uh, like Nazi or communist or uh, such things as that. Then they take a look at those cases. Uh, in 1976, there were uh, congressional hearings about this and it was discovered that uh, Bell Telephone had turned over uh, somewhere between 200 and 300,000 telephone conversations to the US government. The US government can then say, we didn't need a wiretap to get this conversation. It was given to us by the phone company. So this is more like a gift. Uh, we didn't even know th th this problem existed at this place. So basically what's happening here is the amendment is uh, protecting people, uh, businesses who turn over material that can be of significance or importance to the federal government. Uh, the law also legalized wireless wiretaps. You know, a wiretap always meant you actually had a physical wire hooked up to somebody's phone system. Well, can we do that wirelessly? Be a lot easier. We don't need access to their local area even. And uh, it, it would just make uh, uh, wiretaps much easier because they'd be wireless. So this, um, this amendment to the 78 Act would allow wireless taps. Uh, they were uh, aimed mostly at protecting American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T, National Security Agency, as I stated uh, earlier here, was getting uh, freebie suspicious phone call conversations from telecommunications companies. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo Relief Security and Democracy Promotion Act, 2006. Uh, the map here shows in red the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You can see it's a very large country located in Central Africa. Obama was the primary sponsor of this uh, legislation. And what this legislation said is, we want to help them establish democracy or maintain democracy. And uh, we're going to give them $2 million uh, to do that. Seems like nothing, $2 million bucks, but anyhow. Uh, Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, 2007. Uh, the Honest Leadership, Open Government Act, uh, written and uh, sponsored by Barack Obama and Russ Feingold, pictured here, who was a Democratic uh, senator from the state of Wisconsin. It added an amendment uh, that, uh, or they added an amendment to this bill that um, disallows the use of corporate aircraft by members of Congress. In other words, some big company will come in and say, well, you're the Congressman from Montana, that's quite a ways away. You have to pay 
uh, $450 to fly home on weekends or get back to your state so you can campaign a little bit, shake hands at a mall, et cetera. Costs a lot of money going back and forth all the time. So what we'll do is you can fly on one of our corporate aircraft free of charge. Uh, by the way, could you get a bill passed for us? So what are you gonna get in return? So this uh, Honest Leadership and Open Government Act was aimed at um, uh, companies not being able to contribute uh, non-money items to uh, political persons. Uh, also, uh, no lobbying jobs for two years after you leave Congress. If you're in Congress, and um, uh, as a result of that, you've got a lot of contacts, other Congress people that you work with, military people uh, that you work with, uh, and they're the big budget item in the federal budget. Uh, so. Uh, you leave uh, your position in Congress, you're a prime candidate for uh, uh, being a lobbyist for some company because you've got all these wonderful contacts. So this bill says you can't become a lobbyist for two years after you leave office. Uh, that assumption is you're going to lose a lot of your contacts in that amount of time. Uh, lobbyists must disclose all contacts with Congress. In other words, uh, people who now go and talk to a member of Congress, be it a representative or a senator, these, peop these uh, lobbyists now have to write down who they've talked to in Congress who they've made contacts with. Uh, it can be by telephone or in person or by mail, et cetera. And all of this information about who the lobbyists have spoken to must be placed on a searchable database. In other words, uh, people can go in and look and see who you've contacted, when you've contacted them, so on. Uh, the fine for violating this uh, runs from fifty to two hundred thousand uh, dollars. The issue uh, for uh, people who supported the bill but were concerned is uh, that just isn't enough money to even hurt a corporate violator. Uh, audits were approved for lobbyists. The United States Government Accountability Office, the GAO, they look into everything that the government does. So the GAO, Government Accountability Office, can now audit the records of any lobbyists. We want to see your financial records, and they'll look at them. How much money have you given to thus and such or so on? What did you get in return for it? How much money are you spending, et cetera? Uh, uh, there are far more lobbyists yeah, than there are uh, Congress people, massively more. Uh, all contributions to politicians, if they're over $5,000, have to be reported to the federal government. Anything under $5,000 you don't have to report. Uh, the $5,000 restriction on contributions ended up becoming uh, ridiculous because political action committees were created, PACs, PACs. Uh, you can start one of these committees and people will contribute to your pact. And the pact, there's no law that says they have to report who contributes to them, nor do they have to report how much. So individuals can uh, contribute to the uh, Save the South Political Action Committee. And uh, 
Southerners can contribute to political candidates, uh, 50 grand or whatever. And that, well, that's a contribution from the PAC. That's not a contribution from individuals. Uh, Obama, further legislation. The Deceptive Practices and Voter Intimidation Act of 2007. This was introduced by Obama and it uh, concerns activities in the state of Maryland. I'm gonna do a little uh, diversion here, a side note. Uh, we're gonna talk about panhandles just for fun. Uh, Here's the state of Maryland. Look at that, it's got a panhandle. Most people uh, think of Texas and Oklahoma as being the panhandle states. The fact is, there's several of them. Uh, we just had a look at Maryland. There's Texas and Oklahoma. There's Florida and Idaho. They look like panhandles. How about Michigan and Mississippi? Kind of a short handle there on Mississippi. Nebraska, Louisiana, <coughs> Alabama, Virginia. Should these states even count? West Virginia, well, that'd be pushing it. Alaska double panhandle. Okay, back to Obama. Uh, Maryland. Uh, this bill introduced by Obama, Deceptive Practices and Voter Intimidation Act. Uh, there was a flyer that was distributed in Maryland and distributed in uh, the African-American communities of the major cities in Maryland. And this flyer stated that here are some Democrats who are supporting the Republican candidates in this state. So if you're a Democrat, uh, think about voting for these Republicans because people in the Democratic Party are supporting these Republican candidates. Well, that wasn't accurate. Uh, it was a lie. So this is called a deceptive practice. It's called voter intimidation, hence the name of the act that Obama introduced. Who were the people affected? Uh, this is Michael Steele. He was the head of the National Republican Party. Uh, if you watch these 24 hour news stations, he's a frequent guest on them. Um, uh, and doing analysis. Uh, he was a candidate for the U.S. Senate from Maryland at the time. So this is one of the Republicans that uh, these flyers were aiming, uh, hey, Democrats support this guy. Uh, this is the uh, gubernatorial candidate for Maryland, Robert Ehrlich. And he was also a uh, targeted in the pamphlets as being a Republican supported by Democrats. So if you're a Democrat, your party supports these two guys. Uh, the bill never got considered in the Senate, so it went nowhere. Uh, it's an interesting thing to compare this uh, to the Facebook controversy that we're hearing a great deal about uh, today. Uh, should broadcast media evaluate ads? Should they evaluate uh, comments before running them? You know, where does freedom of speech start and stop? Uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, if I'm talking to somebody in my house, I can pretty much say anything I want. How does Facebook differ from that? Uh, should, I, should what I say in there be controlled? Who determines if something's a lie, a falsehood? 
or the truth. Uh, do you want uh, do you want corporate executives of uh, places like Facebook deciding what gets said in their space? Uh, that's it's being done. The Iraq War De-Escalation Act, 2007. Uh, Obama had been speaking against the war since 2003. We talked earlier about during his campaign for the Senate in 2004, he spoke of two anti-Iraq war uh, protests. Uh, and, uh, uh, he had uh, spoken against George W. Bush Iraq policies also. Here's a map of the Middle East, uh, includes part of North Africa. I've drawn a big black circle there around Iraq. You can see to the east of Iraq is Iran, to the north is Turkey, to the south is Saudi Arabia. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that's what this act is about. Uh, there is a war going on there. Uh, what do we want to do about it? Obama says we want to de-escalate it. Make less of it. Troop numbers cannot exceed 21,500. That was part of this bill. Uh, Reports on the war's progress have to be released every 90 days. How are things going? What's happened? What's been taken over by us? What's been taken over by them? Uh, what, uh, what are the needs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, continue training Iraqi forces. We now know that uh, uh, lots of Iraqis uh, who we wanted to take over this war were lined up getting money, getting weapons, et cetera. But uh, as soon as uh, the US started to get out, they all disappeared. Uh, they were there for other reasons, uh, mostly financial. Uh, but this bill in 2007 called for the continued training of Iraqi forces. The bill was considered uh, by Congress, but failed. Uh, the Defense Authorization Act of 2007, uh, sponsored by Obama, uh, five provisions, treatment for veterans with personality disorders. So mental health treatment, make that uh, a, a bigger part of the uh, veterans services. Uh, martial law declaration was made easier for the uh, president of the United States. Uh, you know, uh, uh, martial law is, well, okay, everybody uh, have to be in your house from six in the morning or six at night till six in the morning. Nobody can be out on the streets unless you're going to work, et cetera. And, uh, the president being able to declare that uh, frequently it's done in states, it's done by governors. Uh, this gives the president uh, greater leeway in declaring martial law. Uh, the president, uh, this bill would also allow the president to take over National Guard units. Now, despite that name, National Guard, these are not federal entities, they are state entities. And uh, usually it's the governors that say, okay, National Guard, come on out. There's been a tornado in Bemidji. Or, okay, National Guard, come on out. There are riots in St. Paul. Uh, this would no longer require a governor's approval. It would allow the president to call up National Guard units. Uh, the inspector general position for the uh, nation of Iraq, that's a United States position. 
they're in there looking at uh, how things are going. They eliminate that, this bill would. Uh, $300 billion would be added to the military budget. Uh, that's a big chunk of money. It, it was, at the time, it was like, uh, you know, 30% of the uh, bud budget getting added in. Uh, Iran Sanctions Enabling Act. Uh, a lot of United States company, now this is Iran, different, different country, but uh, we had uh, been in Iran. Uh, United States companies had investments there in Iran. Uh, this law allowed them to get out of Iran uh, because doing business there might have become more difficult, uh, et cetera. Anyhow, they could get out, no consequences, get your company uh, out of that nation state. Uh, and uh, investors can't sue you for leaving there uh, and that they might account for losses that your investors had. Uh, employees cannot sue you because they might lose something such as retirement funds uh, uh, as a result of your moving your company out of Iran. Uh, children's health insurance program known as CHIP uh, this, uh, if you're a wounded veteran and you come back home and you might have difficulty working uh, or need some sort of support, uh, you're wounded in some way, we're going to provide uh, job protection for you. You can't be laid off or fired because of your uh, incapacity and will provide health insurance for families of wounded veterans if you have children, hence children's health insurance program. And uh, that's, of course, is still in existence. These things, these things passed if I don't say anything about that. Uh, let's take a look at um, what Senate committees Obama served on during uh, his uh, three and a half or four, four years in the Senate. Uh, the first uh, committees he was appointed to, there were four, foreign relations, the environment, uh, public works, and veterans affairs. Then, he left those committees and he moved into these three, health, education, labor, and pensions, homeland security, and government affairs. Uh, foreign relations was uh, probably the most exciting uh, uh, Senate committee that he served on, and that's because it involved a lot of travel. Uh, this can help you when you're gonna run for president in 2008. You can say, I've been to Asia, Africa, Europe, the Middle East. I served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Foreign relations can become a big deal in election campaigns, especially at the national level. And uh, so this could be a tremendous aid to Obama. Obama's presidential run, by the way, uh, I'm sitting here with my windows open in my house and there's just started about three minutes ago, a tremendous amount of rainfall. Uh, anyhow, uh, presidential run announcement 2008. Uh, it's February, 2007. We're 18 months before uh, the election in November of 2008 and Obama announces his candidacy. Uh, has the United States become the home of the endless campaign? Uh, we used to talk about campaigns lasting a year. Now we got people announcing a couple of years in advance. 
we have people announcing even further in advance than that. It becomes pretty obvious if somebody's going to run or not in some cases. Uh, in England, let's do some comparison. All campaigns are one month in length. You announce that, um, okay, the government is ending. There will be an election in one month. Or if the government uh, in power, the party in power and the government fails to pass a piece of legislation, there is a uh, campaign. It lasts one month. Or if you go five years and everything is fine in England, uh, you have to have an election, even though you've been passing all the legislation that you proposed. So you could have an election after a month of being in office in England. It has happened. It could be five years later. It could be two years later. So. Campaigns are limited to one month. Uh, everyone involved in the campaign is given free TV time. You get to do so many commercials per day for 30 days. Second thing, commercials have to be five to eight minutes in length. Uh, this is uh, something of substance has to be said as a result of it. Here's my policies on thus and such, and here's what I'm gonna do. And you have to talk about that for a minimum of five minutes, a maximum of eight minutes. You can't just do a sound bite. Uh, campaigns in the US, uh, here's some of the complaints. They're way too long, they're way too expensive, and the commercials that we get are sound bites. Some are 10 seconds, some are 30 seconds, some are 60 seconds. So they're slogans. Now, in support of long campaigns, here's a recently deceased former vice president, Walter Mondale. He said, a campaign should be long. A person that's gonna sit in the United States presidency uh, should have to survive something like that. It tests you as a candidate and it's good preparation for the office. Obama announced in uh, Springfield, Illinois uh, at the state capitol. Uh, here's a picture of the state capitol there in Springfield. Uh, this is the same place that Abraham Lincoln made his famous speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That phrase actually comes from the Bible. Uh, Mark 325, Jesus says, and if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I guess Lincoln read the Bible. Uh -huh. Obama announcement included uh, the following items. Wants to reform health care. Wants to end the war in Iraq. And he wants to move to energy independence. We are buying a tremendous amount of energy from foreign countries. Energy independence would allow us to uh, have more energy that we control. Uh, and have easy access to. The Democratic uh, candidates, look at this list, there's 10 of them uh, running for the, uh, in the primaries. Joe Biden was one of them, current president. Uh, but look at the list. Every single one of these people is a politician. There's a couple governors in there, several US senators. There's a US representative. Uh, you see Barack Obama's fourth up from the bottom. Hillary Clinton was involved in this campaign. Christopher Dodd was US senator from an Eastern state. John Edwards from, uh, I think he was one of the Carolinas. Uh, Mike Gravel, uh, he was, I think he was Alaska. 
Dennis Kucinich, U.S. Representative Obama, Bill Richardson, a governor of a southwestern state, and he'd also been a cabinet member. But those are the known names. Here's 12 more. That's a total of 22 people running for the Democrat nomination or the Democratic Party nomination. Here's people you've never heard of. Willie Carter, been in the military. There's a business executive, a couple of them. Uh, Keith Russell Judd, they're down in the middle. Criminal and perennial candidate. He's running every presidential uh, primary since 1996 when he got out of prison after serving a 12 year term. Uh, so here's a list of people that uh, are little known. Uh, that's 22 candidates. Some of them uh, have a screw loose or the screw is totally missing. Uh, surprises, people that didn't run, Tom Daschle, he'd been the Senate Majority Leader from the Dakotas. Uh, Howard Dean, uh, former governor. Russ Feingold, Wisconsin Senator. Al Gore uh, did not run. He'd been the nominee in 2000. John Kerry didn't run. He was the uh, Democratic Party nominee in 2004. Uh, the only one that's not a politician here was Al Sharpton, a clergyman, a uh, black man who you regularly see on uh, news, 24-hour uh, news channels. And, and Mark Warner, former governor. Uh, how are we doing, Judy? Well, um, we've got about 15 minutes, so... Uh, we could uh, stop and take some questions. There aren't too many questions waiting, but there are, there's one anyway. Um, what would you like to do? Well, only one question, I'd say. So far, people will put more in once you stop. Okay, well, let's start with the questions then. Okay, Thanks. well, now I will turn it over to the audience. It is your turn. We do still have a few minutes, so. Uh, you're, please type your questions into the Q&A column, and uh, I will read them for JB to answer. And uh, our first question, uh, in the Transparency Act, um, I guess this was uh, during uh, Obama's senatorial uh, service, did the company need to reveal which subsidiary got money and how much they received? Uh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you had to tell amounts uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to, think, to remember if there was a limit there or not, but anyway, uh, yeah, that was, that's part of it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we are still waiting for other questions to come in. So while they do, I'll ask a question of my own. Oh, wait, here we go. Here's a question. Um, how influential was Obama's speech at the Democratic Convention when he was a senator? And I think as she, uh, this questioner may be referring to the speech in 2004, the, the very famous speech uh, when he talked about blue America and red America. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me, uh, no. but let's assume that's the speech. Yeah, he was running for the United States Senate. So this was a tremendous uh, boost for him to be, uh, number one, he uh, got onto the national stage because he did the keynote address at the Democratic Convention. And, um, uh, and it made him, uh, you know, an even bigger star kind of in Illinois. However, he really didn't need that exposure. He, he won that election with 70% of the vote. Mm -hmm. but so at the time he gave this speech, he was, uh, he was not yet a, the senator. He was a candidate for the Senate. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, wow. So that 2004 Democratic uh, National Convention was uh, a speech he gave when he was uh, running for the Senate, which would have mm -hmm. been in November. So it was 
three or four months before the, um, the election uh, for president and, uh, of uh, John Kerry and mm -hmm. for uh, the election of senators in the state of Illinois and all a third of the mm -hmm. states that had Senate elections those years. Uh, so it gave, it, it gave him some national attention. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. Okay, all right, we'll leave that for, for the moment. Um, what percent of Obama's US Senate bills passed? Legislation that he introduced when he was in the US Senate, what percentage passed? I, uh, well, I don't know the percentage total. Uh, I would mm -hmm. guess it was probably around 70 to 80 percent, so quite a few. Okay, uh, we've got a number of questions along those lines. Um, and one question that's kind of allied to that, um, when Obama was president, he was criticized for being uh, too detached from the rough and tumble of politics and therefore ineffective or somewhat ineffective in his dealings with Congress. Was he considered an effective senator? Uh, was he a senator who, who managed to pass legislation? Yes, yeah, he was. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, he had this nice guy image. And, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party was opposed to virtually everything that he did. Uh, uh -huh. When Obama became president, he called on the Senate and uh, House of Representatives leadership to come to the White House. Every president does that. You sit there with, within the first week usually, and you talk to the leaders of the legislative branch. And uh, they, ref they refused to meet with him. Mm -hmm. So it was obvious right from the beginning that uh, legislation that he would introduce as president was gonna have a lot of trouble. And Mitch McConnell was asked, why didn't you go meet with him? And McConnell said, we're busy. We got other, <laughs> we got other things to do. And there's a question that uh, relates to that. Uh, there, there were very chill relationships between uh, the Republican-led Congress and the White House during Obama's presidency, but was he well regarded by other senators as a senator, uh, senators from both parties during his uh, term in the Senate? Uh, yeah, he uh, he did get some co-sponsorship from the Republican side, but uh, uh, you know this is two thousand four. That's 17 years ago. The, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the split was already underway. I mean, uh, the more difficult, uh, let's not even talk to each other stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, would the legislation proposed by Obama and opposed by Republicans while he was in the Senate caused difficulty for Obama when he became president. Was that one of the reasons why there was such opposition to his uh, agenda during his presidency? Well, I'd say so in part, yes. Uh, and, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that he introduced uh, veterans legislation and uh, legislation to increase the uh, military budget and uh, problem he had was never being in the military. You know, he went to college the whole uh, nine yards and got beyond the age of being drafted. So he had to uh, he had to look like he supported that uh, whole military establishment. And we talked about a couple of pieces of legislation that uh, indeed did that. Uh, veteran support and increasing the military budget tremendously. Um, so I don't, you know, there's certain issues that you just have to be in favor of. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we do have a few more minutes. So if there are other questions, uh, type them in now. Okay, here comes one. 
Obama sponsored 147 bills in the US Senate. Two became law, he contributed to others as co-sponsor. So yeah. that's, I guess, a summary of his uh, record. Um, so uh, let's see, we do still have some time and, and time for other questions. Uh, did, did you wanna comment on that, JB? Yeah, these major bills that I talked about is what I was discussing. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, th those are the bills that passed and uh, I told the ones that didn't pass. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was in the, uh, yeah, that 147 and only two passed. Hmm. Yeah. That's that, that's some uh, impressive statistics, huh? Well, uh, that uh, that sounds like a low. Well, it, maybe it, this hey, that was in the Senate. Yeah, I, I maybe this doesn't take into account uh, bills that he was a co-sponsor of that ultimately passed. Maybe this was individually yeah. sponsored sure. bills. Um, there's a, there's a lot of bills that you can put your name on. Mm -hmm. but she really didn't have anything to do with them. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, I'll ask a question of my own. One I've always wondered about, uh, I think you mentioned that less than, or about 10% of the population of Illinois was African-American at the time uh, that Obama was won an overwhelming victory. Um, what, what, you know, what was the secret of his success and why did it, um, I guess he went from being a, a sort of non-controversial, extremely popular African-American to somebody who was really, uh, while he was president, uh, the target of, of, you know, quite offensive racial, racist attacks, attacks. And what caused that shift? Well, uh, national attention for starters uh you know illinois is a different state than southern and southwestern uh states are uh, all of a sudden you're you got a much broader sweep to be criticized by um and uh I, I don't, you know, he was just, he was a rising. Frozen. Uh, I, I, okay, JB, I, I think, were you frozen or was it me? I, I couldn't hear you for a minute. Oh. Uh, yeah, he, uh, I, yeah, I, it looked like you were, but. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I hope for the audience's sake, it was me that was frozen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we. He, um, mm -hmm. a, you know, a rising young star from a new generation, and then a black man to boot. And mm -hmm. even though he was not, uh, he did not come out of the United States slave experience. His father was Africa, was from Kenya. And I talked about that last week that, you know, he was not. Uh, and uh, Judy, let's do another reminder that there's no class next week. Okay, we are almost out of time. So especially since uh, somewhere there's an unstable connection, I think JB managed, mentioned uh, really bad weather uh, a few minutes ago, and I think that must have reached where I am now because it does seem to be pretty stormy here. So um, we are going to end today. We're we're pretty much out of time. There are no open questions, but oh, Judy, hi. We've uh, you are freezing up, and your <laughs> voice has been fine throughout. Uh, but you are freezing, and not as, uh, we're losing your voice soon. Uh, can you hear me now without a picture? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to take it away because uh, we are three minutes from uh, 2 o'clock. So uh, I want to thank everyone, but remind them 
we will not have a talk next week. Our next talk will be two Wednesdays from today, uh, October 27, I believe that is. Uh, but we will see you then. We look forward to it. Thank everyone. I'm sorry that um, my uh, uh, picture and, and my voice, I guess, are having a few problems. But uh, hopefully next uh, time we see you, no storm, and we'll have a great um, transmission then. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.